In the days of chaos, the cosmic regime changed. Are we living in the last days? And that's a question that, that uh, you know, some people go, well, you can't use the six o'clock news for your exegesis. Well, why can't I? You know, it, and if, you, if, if you accept that argument, then you're already down the rabbit hole. I'm, I'm supposed to watch and be ready. That's what Jesus warns us. Watch and be ready. Watch and ready for what? And Chuck, Dr. Chuck talks about this, that the confidential briefing, most of us know what that is. When Jesus takes his disciples and goes, they go, hey, what's, what's going to be like when you, when you come back? The end of the age. What's, this, what's going to happen? And they asked him, saying, Master, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, take heed that ye not be deceived. I love this one. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah. Stop right there. Think about this, folks. This is two, almost 2,000 years ago. And Jesus, no one knows who this guy is. He's got the 12 bozos or 12 stooges as disciples, with all due respect. Seriously. They're always getting him in trouble. No one knows who he is. There's no PR. There's no YouTube channels. And no oh, Jesus of Nazareth. Nothing like that. And he utters this absurd statement. Many will come in my name. Wait a minute. Who does, who does this guy think he is? Many will come in my name and say, I am the Messiah. And he says, do not be deceived. The time draweth near, go ye not therefore after them, but when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things first must come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then he said to them, listen to his punch list, nation shall rise against nation, and that is in confusion, by the way, kingdom against kingdom, which is exactly what we see in the Middle East, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Great earthquakes shall be in diverse places. Think about this. This is what I call a, a spiritual bone to the dogs. That's what it is. He could just say there'll be earthquakes. But he says in diverse places, 2,000 years ago, when he's stating this, if a 9.0 tembler happens in Fukushima and you live in the Galilee, you're not going to know about it. Now my iPhone pings. Now we sit in a, you know, we munch Fritos and dip while we watch the big tidal wave come in and kill 20,000 people. Live TV. It's, we're, we're off to the races here. Earthquakes in diverse places, you bet. Then he says, famines, pestilence, fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. So with that little warm, happy, you know, isn't it, doesn't it make you feel good? <laughs> yes, sir. I want more doom and gloom. This is what cracks me up. We hear about the prosperity gospel, and I get that. You know, Jesus has a plan for my life. I get that. But we are living in such tenuous, tumultuous, unprecedented times. I've never seen anything like it. And let me ask you something, and I do this. This is not the UFO question, so don't go there. And I want a show of hands. I want a show of hands on how many people sitting in this room right now think that we're better off than when we were 15 years ago. <laughs> One person. Where's my handgun? Stand up, sir. <laughs> Just joking. And wherever I go, it's the same thing. Not a hand in the room, basically. Not a hand in the room. It's, it's absolutely amazing. We all know it. We all feel it. It's, it's visceral. It's visceral. We all know something is terribly wrong. Unfortunately, most of the pastors never talk about any of this stuff. You're going to hear about it today. And go back and tell your people what's going on and vote for the Donald. Vote for the Donald. Because if the witch gets in with a B, if the witch gets in with a B, quoting Rush Limbaugh here, we're in, we're in a heap of trouble. Endless abortions, endless borders, open borders, endless debt, it's over. Okay, many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and the time draweth near, go ye not there after him. This guy is called the Russian Messiah. Notice the, the long hair. He looks just like Jesus, kind of. You could, he could be in a play or a movie or something. Watch what happens. Watch the people, how they absolutely adore this guy. This is present day, and he is in Russia. He's got thousands of people, and here's the Russian Messiah. Look at the adoration. Look at the worship. Look at the goofy, demonic grin. Look at the costumes. If you're ever in a place and everybody's dressed in a costume, run to the nearest exit. Trust me, trust me. If they want you to wear a costume, get out of there as fast as you can. Look at the women, they're crying, they're weeping. Look at the costumes. This guy believes he's Jesus. There's the goofy grin. He's got nothing. Look at the costumes, they're throwing flowers. Watch the bliss, the adoration, the open adoration. Now they sing a little song here. He's praying. I mean, he, you know, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. There's a costume. Like the guy's hat on the right. 
I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. Let's move on because if you want it, you can Google it, the Russian Messiah, and see it for yourself. In 1982, um, there was full-page ads in the LA Times, New York Times, London Times, and papers on the uh, European continent, all stating, and that's a lot of money back then, like $50,000 for a full-page ad, that's a lot of money in, in 1982 dollars. It's a lot of money. And this is the, in the days before the internet. So this is how you advertise. The Christ is now here. The guy's name is Benjamin Krem, who still is alive, by the way, although he's getting up there now. He's the spokesperson for the uh, Share International. And the, guy, the guy's name is Maitreya. And what they were saying with all this, it is with great pleasure that we share with you information about the emergence of Maitreya, the world teacher for all humanity. We believe that in time, Maitreya will be seen as fulfilling the expectations of the world's traditions, religious or non-religious, for a coming one. Get this. Whether as Christ, Messiah, the fifth Buddha, Krishna, or the Iman Mahdi, at this time of great political, economic, and social crisis, Maitreya will inspire humanity to see itself as one family and create a civilization based on sharing, economic, and social justice, peace, and global cooperation. Sounds really good. Where do I sign up for that? Except this guy is obviously an imposter. Many will come in my name and tell you and me that they are the Messiah. Watch this. Watch this clip. And this is Benjamin Krem. Yes. Many of us have been affected by the crisis happening in the world today. But something wonderful is happening, even as we speak. Everybody on earth, without exception, is longing for, seeking, aiming for, consciously or subconsciously, for unity. A sense of unity. What if cooperation now could truly this. replace competition in every sphere of life? The competition which surrounds and controls everyone today is the very opposite of unity and trust. According to British author Benjamin Krem, Maitreya, a teacher of extraordinary stature, is here in the world to inspire us to make the fundamental changes that will usher in an unprecedented golden age of brotherhood and justice. <laughs> This and, and I think you guys get, get what I'm, you know, I mean, if you want to know more about it, just, just go to Share International. Um, I could spend literally the rest of my topic just on this one, one guy and what he's done since 1982 and the reemergence of the Bethlehem star, but I digress. Alan John Miller, welcome to the Divine Truth website. My name is Alan John Miller, and many of my friends call me AJ. The beautiful woman you see me with is Mary Suzanne Locke. Well, she's out of luck in my opinion, but I, you know, anyway. Just a little over 2,000 years ago, we arrived on earth for the first time. My name then was Yeshua ben Yosef, or Jesus of the Bible, the son of Joseph and Mary. Mary's name went, then was Mary of Magdala. The woman identified in the Bibles is Mary Magdalene. Mary was my wife then, and the first person I appeared to after I was crucified. Because of my personal desire and passion for God as I grew, I recognized not only that I was a Messiah that was foretold by ancient prophets, but also that I was in a process designed by God that all humans could follow if they so desired. I call this process becoming born again. It is the process of the human soul being transformed into the divine, the process of becoming at one with God. Many persons who were connected with me in the first century came to know and follow this path while on earth, the most notable person being Mary Magdalene, who is my soulmate who was actually married to me in the first century and was pregnant with our daughter when I died. This guy's got a following, as do all these people. This guy is called the Brazilian Jesus. Notice the costumes. He says he is Jesus Christ, and now he is back in Brazil. Notice the Henry costumes. Cristo, as he calls himself, has been preaching this belief for 30 years now. Whoever he is, he was born in Brazil with the name Alvaro Thais to farmers with a German heritage. In 1969, he decided he was Nostradamus. And then a decade later, he claims he had a vision that said he was Jesus. Not everyone is as convinced as he is. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. The bottom line is, folks, I could sit here the rest of the afternoon and show example after example after example. No one's coming back going, hey, I'm the incarnation of Buddha. No one's going, I think I'm Lord Krishna. No one's doing that. Nobody's doing that. But we have imposter after imposter saying that they are the Messiah. That's a wake-up call. That's a wake-up call. And there's a whole bunch of them running around on the planet as we speak. <laughs> Go figure. So Yeshua, Jesus tells us, and when these things begin to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. 
not to build a bunker, not to argue about pre, mid, and post, but I'm, st I'm staunchly pre, staunchly. We get beamed up out of here, can't wait for that. And, but that's what he tells us to do. So we're supposed to watch and be ready, and we're supposed to be looking up, looking up in, in expectation, because it could happen literally at any time. We, most of us know that. It could happen at any time. And with what's going on over in the Middle East and, and on, on a global scenario, as you'll see, I mean, every, every morning I kind of wake up going, is this it? Is something going to happen which is going to trigger events? It can't go on this way forever. The Middle East, and I'm, I'm, I digress a little bit here. You'll see in a second we'll, we'll get there. But it can't go on like this forever. It can't. It's impossible. Some, some, she's got to blow, sir. She's going to blow. The dilithium crystals, Captain. I mean, that's what we're looking at. The thing's going to blow. So, but when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. The end is not by and by. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. First of all, we've got wars and rumors of war. I mean, it is absolutely on a global level, not since the Cold War, have we had this sort of vitriol, saber rattling, going between Russia and the United States. Thank you, our President POTUS, leading from behind. I'm leading from behind. You certainly are, sir. You don't have a clue as to what you're doing. And I better be careful because I know the NSA is watching, but I, 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 I digress. Hamas gets millions of dollars in aid. Oh, poor Hamas. And you've got to remember this, that, that the media in this country is so stacked, so anti-Semitic, it's alarming. I better be careful at the edge of the stage. Or, Don't do it, Ali. You're making me nervous. It's making me nervous. So look, Hamas gets millions of dollars because the Israelis gave back Gaza, Okay. That was the whole Oslo thing, land for peace. The Israelis give them land. They get no peace, as Netanyahu says. As the Israelis are leaving the Gaza Strip, as they're leaving, the mortar shells start coming over. People, you know, the 6 o'clock news, they don't tell you, us, what's really going on. So Hamas gets all this money, and you know what they do? They build terror tunnels. Tunnels of terror. And what that means is they constructed these tunnels which went underground, from Gaza into Israel, some more than a mile. And they pop up in this wheat field, and the whole idea is to go into the kibbutz, kill a bunch of people, take other people prisoner, and drag them back to Gaza and hold them for ransom. And that was the last little skirmish that they had in Gaza. Israel is surrounded by those who pose a direct existential threat to her. There's no doubt about it. You've got Hezbollah with 150,000 rockets. We interviewed Dan Gordon in, in, in our Watchers, um, Watchers 9, Days of Chaos, which is where this is from, and also the book Days of Chaos. So if you want to dig deep, you can get that. But we sat down with Dan Gordon, and, and, and Gordon just said, look, Hezbollah has at least 150,000 rockets. Many of them have been uh, converted, have been retrofitted. So if, 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 they, if they're launching 3,000 a day or, or 5,000 or 10,000 a day, what do they care? Israel can't possibly get them all. Do you see where it's going? And then you got Hamas doing the same thing, and then you got the crazy Iranians. So they are surrounded, not to mention ISIS. They are absolutely surrounded by those who pose a direct existential threat to Israel's very existence. And that's not a good thing. And this is, look, I've never seen it like this before. And I've been tracking this stuff. I've been a Christian 36 years. I mean, I've been tracking this stuff forever. I've never seen it this tenuous, this unbalanced, this volatile. Who would have imagined the Arab Spring? The Syrian war has been going on, what, five years? Hundreds of thousands of people moving from that. I'm going to show you some drone footage taken of the area around Damascus. Damascus has not yet been destroyed. There's this expat Syrian guy that I know. He works in a convenience store. So, I've, you know, it's like... If I, if I ask him, I go, I notice the accent right off, and I go, oh, wow, that, that's a very interesting accent. Where are you from? And he kind of looks very nervously, Syria. And I go, oh, really? Cool. What's happening in Damascus? And then he's like, whoa. So, but I got to know this guy, and he told me he took like a quarter and laid, laid like a, a, drew a circle on a piece of paper the size of a quarter. He says, that's Damascus. And then he drew a large circle around the quarter, and he said, that's the area around Damascus, dead zone. The area around Damascus, and you'll see it, is basically not, it's, it's been reduced to rubble. Certain parts of Damascus have been destroyed. I've heard up to a third, but much of it is still intact. So it's really hard to get real intel. But as Bill Salas will tell you, it's not, you know, suddenly destroyed. That's future. It's going to come. But it's got to happen at some point. 
I mean, Assad is backed up into a corner. You've got the number of 300,000. I'm being conservative. It could be 500,000 dead. And some of the most heinous torture is going on. I mean, stuff that you can't even imagine. I won't even repeat it here. Stuff that makes me absolutely sick to my stomach. And guess what? There's a principality that has been in this region, over this region, literally for millennia. And that principality has never been deposed. So when we see ISIS and doing all these crazy things, they are following their father, which, of course, is Satan. Let's move on. The message came to me concerning Damascus. Look, Damascus will disappear. It will become a heap of ruins. Look at the drone footage right here. As far as the eye can see. And the six o'clock news doesn't show you this. The six o'clock news doesn't tell you anything about this. They never show you this kind of footage. Why? Because they want to keep us as ignorant and as dumbed down as possible, lest we actually wake up and start going, hey, wait a minute, what's going on? Who's running the show here? You tell me, is that a ruinous seat? Look at the rubble. And we don't see anything about this. Chuck, you said something on, a, on one of our watchers, actually the very first watchers, when we were, he was gracious enough to consent us an interview. So watchers won. And Chuck said a phrase which I have used repeatedly over and over and over again. And I always give him credit if I'm writing it or saying it. Because I believe if, you, if I've heard something from someone, it's not, I didn't originate it. I need to pass, you know, give credit to where credit is due. And Chuck said, we live in a managed agenda. And that's exactly what, what this is. It is a managed agenda. The news cycle is a managed agenda including Fox News, thank you very much. So I think you get the, get the idea of what's going on here. And this, of course, has created this great influx of refugees into the country. ISIS beheads 20, 21 Christians. Our president, with all due respect to the office and to him as a man, but you know, in my opinion, and I say this with all due respect, and look, Krothheimer, Charles Krothheimer, the commentator, has called him the great amateur, and that's exactly what he is. He's an amateur. He has no clue as to what he's doing. Oh, ISIS, the JV team. No, they're not, sir. No, they're not. And it happened under Hillary, the witches with a B. Watch. That's when it happened. ISIS rose to the forefront and they become a menace. We're taking back the same cities we took back decades ago. What about our blood and treasure? What about the military people who come back and they have, you know, all these, all these traumatic things that they post-traumatic stress syndrome and they can't get help? Why doesn't the media cover this? Why doesn't the media? You can see I'm really ticked off. Easy LA, you're going to blow a gasket. <laughs> Calm down now. But I get really ticked off here. Why doesn't the media tell us like they used to do in Vietnam, today in Vietnam, 60 of our soldiers were killed in the Tet Offensive. That's Walter Cranky, for those of you who don't know. So that's what we used to hear, and it got to the point where, what are we doing over there? And people began to say, we're not doing this anymore, and we shut it down. They don't tell you because lest you know, you'll do something. How many people, how many of our blood and treasure shot or killed themselves in some way this week? Committed suicide because they couldn't deal with the post-traumatic stress. You tell me, why don't we have that figure? Why don't we know about it? Once again, we're dumbed down, we're kept in the dark, my people perish for lack of knowledge. ISIS is one of the most barbaric entities that have ever graced this planet. Absolutely. These guys are, I mean, they think of different ways of killing every week. Well, we'll boil someone in oil. Well, we'll listen to this, my favorite story. I'll just digress because I can't, I only got 30 minutes left. Go, go, go. Real quick. There's, one, there's a guy with a flamethrower tank, right, flamethrower, and they have 12 people that they're going to kill from the village. They're going to burn them alive with a flamethrower. This is how wacky these people are. Just can't shoot them. No, like the Nazis used to do. We're going to burn them with a flamethrower. So some, it's all on video. Some guy's like reading this stupid thing, you know, the whole stupid deal, right? And the guy with the flamethrower is behind him. So unbeknownst to them, about a mile away is a British sniper who's well trained, thank you. And he's got his rifle trained on the tanks of the flamethrower. And when he's done his stupid little rant, I look bad, blah, 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 and he's getting ready to do the flamethrower, the sniper opens fire with a 50 cal. The whole thing blows up. The two guys are getting the 12 hostages are rescued. Yes! Yes! I love it! And then, and then we make the most stupidest deal in human history with the Iranians. Do we, can we trust these people? No! But of course, I'm really out of it. I'm sorry. I'm getting really... 
calm, LA, you're just, come on, come on, calm down. So the Iranians are really, we can't trust them, folks, because we can't trust the Iranians. Trump has said it over, Trump stated it's the worst deal, and he's right, it's the worst deal. And now we know that the money that was on the airplane was ransom money. Managed agenda. Everything is corrupt. Drain the swamp. Drain the swamp. It, Iran not supposed to test missiles. So what does Iran do? It writes on the ballistic missile, <laughs> death to Israel. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I'm sure Bill's going to talk about the destruction of the Bashar reactor. Israel has to do it. They have no other choice. They've got to cut the heads off the snakes. Hezbollah, Hamas, Iran, ISIS. They've got to do it, which means they expand their territory. Psalm 83. And that might trigger Isaiah 17, which then might trigger Ezekiel 38. We don't know, but if we're not in that window of time, I'll shave my head and become a Buddhist. So, <laughs> then we've got this guy, the Muslim Brotherhood. This is Safwat Hagazi. This is when Mohammed Morsi was going, running for election. He was elected. He lasted, I think, less than a year. He was deposed by the military. He's now serving life in prison. For, it's just like the Muslim Brotherhood. Watch what they say, and I'm, I just, I'll get a show of hands. Here. Watch this. Get this. And here's the deal, folks. How many of you have seen that clip on a 6 o'clock news? Anybody? And you know why they don't show you that? Because we live in a managed agenda. We live in a managed agenda. Wake up. Go back and shake your pastors. Let them know what's going on. If you saw that clip, you'd go, whoa, wait a minute. Everybody yelling, Allah Akbar. Everybody telling us, Mart Jerusalem, we go, martyrs in the millions. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Now look, we're supposed to love everyone on this planet. I get that. We're supposed to be able to witness and love people who are Muslims. Jesus is appearing in dreams and visions over there. I get it. He loves them too. So it's a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not preaching Islamophobia here. Don't misunderstand me. But we can't be stupid either. The ideology of this whole thing is incredibly anti-American and very, very virulently anti-Semitic. But we're, if you see someone, you love them until they show you that you can't do that. And then you got to be smart, right? you got to be smart. So we get the, the whole four blood moons thing, Chuck talked about a little bit about that last night in one of the Q&A. Hey, LA, with all the hype with the blood moons, nothing happened. This is a composite of complaints I got from people at the end of 2015. Doggone it, LA, I wanted the planet to split in half. And it didn't. <laughs> I'm really ticked off. I want my money back on the blood moons thing. Whoa, whoa, easy. First of all, Russia's in the Middle East. One million Muslims entered into Europe. Russia coming down in the Middle East is absolutely, in my opinion, unprecedented. Unprecedented. And they ain't leaving, folks. War, more report, a go-go. Then we've got what, what uh, Charles Martel in the Battle of Tours did and the Battle at the Gates of Vienna several centuries ago was completely overturned when Merkel just goes, come on in. Refugees, welcome. Now we've got refugees and, and refugee camps and all sorts of nonsense going on, and it's over without firing a shot. It's over. I think there's a, another half a million came in since this, since this was done. So those events are absolutely unprecedented. Absolutely. Un we've never seen anything like that. A million refugees pouring into the country. It's one thing if they want to assimilate. It's one thing if they want to embrace that, the, 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 the host country's way of life. It's another if they want Sharia. 
And that's why when Newt Gingrich stands up and says, every Muslim should be required to take a test. Do you, do you uphold the Constitution or Sharia? But because Muslims are allowed to lie, how can you get a straight answer? Bingo. Watch this. This is Germany. Notice the black ISIS flag. So it's changing the very cultural fabric of the European continent. And isn't it funny how Obama lets all the Syrian refugees in, but it's less than 1% Christian in this country. Again, it's deliberate, it's managed, it's deliberate. If Hillary gets in, it's over. This guy's yelling and screaming, he's one of those radical imams, and he's just basically saying, death to America, death to democracy, death to England. Go back to your own country. But we're so sick of this, no I'm so sick of this nonsense, I can't even tell you. All these guys standing up and, you know, yelling and screaming and Allah Akbar and all this. I'm just absolutely sick to death of it. I really am. And this is why what Trump's saying, we need to monitor the mosque. You know what? We need to monitor the mosque in this country, period, period. And if there's hate speech, you close it down and you move them out. That's it. You've got the Shia Crescent. This is unprecedented. If I have my pointer, I would show you. But alas, I am without a pointer. So look at the map with Iran. Right? Go up to Syria and then Lebanon. That's the upper part of the crescent. Then swing over to Yemen. That's the other part. That is a Shia crescent. The Shia uh, Muslims are the, are, the, are the minority. The Sunnis are the majority. And this is why Saudi Arabia is building this huge wall to keep out the people down in Yemen, the Houthis in particular. But they, you know, no one says a word about Saudi Arabia building a wall. No one says a peep about that. But Trump talks about building a wall. Let me ask you something. How many people in this room, watch the hands. How many people in this room have not, have not had someone go through rehab? Have not had a family member go through rehab? Have not. Okay, look around, folks. Look around. I'd say less than 30% of the audience have not. That means that 70% of you people have had someone in your family that went through rehab. 50 years ago, we didn't know what rehab was. I couldn't spell it. Now, I, now I'm going to one. I mean, give me a break. Iran calls, controls two waterways. The Strait of Tears, which is down uh, near Ethiopia, and the Strait of Hormuz, which is, which is bristling with missiles and everything else. That's about 40 to 50% of the world's oil comes through those two checkpoints. What do you think is going to happen in World War III? And by the way, Iran is, uh, Iran is, is allied with, um, with Russia. Then we've got North Korea, uh, and, and a nutcase who was treated like a god there. And this guy is a nutcase. I mean, he's, he's, he's absolutely... Volatile and unpredictable. And by the way, uh, they have concentration camps which rival the atrocities that happened under the Nazis in Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen and other places happening right now. We have a body called the United Nations which is supposed to do something about this stuff. It's nonsense. It's a joke. They don't do anything except get money and have two martini lunches. So, LA is really ticked off. Then we've got Afghanistan. 16 years almost trillion dollar opium harvest every year, a trillion dollar opium harvest every year, a trillion dollar opium. And, and what, how many people die over there every week? Why don't we know about this? What are we doing over there for crying out loud? Why are we there? Trillion dollar opium harvest. Afghan opium crop sets for a record high. Then we've got the financial collapse, which may happen. We've got the BRICS nation, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, who are trying to coalesce a, a global currency other than the, the U.S. petrodollar, which is, you know, I mean, look at what's going on with the petrodollar. Look at gold, look at silver. And silver's been held down artificially. I mean, you could go off on this stuff all day long and talk about it. But the bottom line is, this is why gas prices are so artificially low. Because Russia is the second, the world's second exporter of oil. And they're hitting the Russians financially by artificially controlling the price of oil. Remember two summers ago, you know, out in L.A. it was like six bucks a gallon. Now it's like way down there. Why? Because they're in, this is like the Cold War. This is like an economic thing. BRICS nations are trying to bankrupt or move the global currency off the U.S. petrodollar. And by the way, from what I've, from what I've heard, there are certain Middle Eastern countries which are now trading in BRICS rather than U.S. petrodollars, and that got Saddam whacked. Russia is protecting its only Middle, only Middle East allies. Russia is leading a charge away from the petrodollar. Russia is preparing to invade the Middle East. That's World War III. We are looking at it, and that will be Shia against Sunni. That's what World War III is, and it's already happening in front of us. There are planes flying, there, and no one knows who's fighting who, because all the alliances are, are all whacked out. You know, it depends on, well, who's, who are we fighting with? It's just crazy. 
but you don't hear word one about this. When these things begin to pass, look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. Famines, okay, great. Famines are pretty low right now. Not a lot happening there. Pestilence, so 39 million people have died from AIDS. That's a global tragedy. But it's not like we're, we're facing like the, uh, the flu that happened in, 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 during World War I. The bottom line is these statistics change overnight like that. It doesn't take much to upset the apple cart. So even though right now we're not in a period of global famine or, or um, statistically speaking with, with pestilence and stuff, this could all change and it could change very quickly. Why? Because we have events like Fukushima. Listen to this, this is on the fifth anniversary. Today Japan marks the fifth anniversary of a tragic and catastrophic meltdown of the Fukushima nuclear plant on March 11, 2011. A massive earthquake and tsunami hit the northeast coast of Japan, killing 20,000 people. Another 160,000 then flooded the radiation in Fukushima. It was the world's worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl. And according to some, it would be far worse if the Japanese government did not cover up the true severity of the devastation. The fuel rods in reactor four the fuel rods, the radioactive fuel rods in Reactor 4 have melted through the containment shield and no one has a clue as to where they are. No one knows where it is. It's not contained and it just continues to melt and melt and melt. Groundwater and perhaps the Pacific. And you don't hear a word one about this. Far worse than Chernobyl, in my opinion. We've well, got super volcanoes. You've got the Katla and the Ayafalahoka volcano in Iceland. You've got Yellowstone, which could erupt. One super volcano goes and life can change overnight. We could be looking at a nuclear winter. Crops don't ripen. Things don't grow. I mean, I'm just hitting on some of this. And, but this is where we are. And when you talk to USGS, which I have, they assure us that everything's okay and the numbers really aren't going up. Then we've got electromagnetic pulse weapons. You know, one, the North Koreans already have this technology. They just take a missile, take a small nuclear device, retrofit an oil tanker, throw the oil tanker out in the Gulf of Mexico, blast the missile up 200 miles, detonate the nuke, and guess what? The electromagnetic pulse puts us back into the pre-industrial revolution times, which means that everything, your cell phones, your camera that this man's about to take right now, ain't gonna work. Your car's not gonna start, the alarm clock, your refrigerator, we go back to the Stone Age. Millions will die, millions will die within the first week. This, look, all I'm doing, all I'm doing as a watchman, I'm just laying it out. A gourmet meal of doom and gloom. Here it is. You tell me, Ellie, you're so negative. Okay, I'm negative. Tell me one thing and I'm, I'm, I'm hyping here. I'm not hyping. All I'm doing is reporting the news. This is, this is what's going on on our planet right now. There's no hype. Earthquakes in diverse places. Notice the line going up. Look at the earthquakes. We got the abortion holocaust. 60 million in the United States. And Hillary Clinton will not say when, that, when the baby in the mother's womb has, is viable. Basically, in her worldview, until the baby is actually out of the birth canal, you can kill it. That's what, that's what she stands for, in my opinion. Because she won't say, when is it viable, Hillary? Well, if it's viable one day before the due date, what about two days? See, slippery slope. What about three days, Hillary? What about five? Is, that, is it still viable at five days before the due date? No, it's, in her mind, in her worldview, as far as I know it, it's only viable when it's out. Until that point, partial birth abortion, do whatever you got to do. And that Planned Parenthood, if you have not seen that Planned Parenthood video, you need to Google that on YouTube, where the woman is drinking her wine and munching on the salad and just casually saying, you know, well, if, if I know they want to deliver, I, I'm just going to grab with the forceps. And, and it's just, it's beyond the pale. This is where we are. He's got to come back soon. And yet the church doesn't do anything. Think about this. If every church on, in America put up, put up billboards, put up full-page ads, we'll take your baby, have the women run it as a ministry, and the guys can get involved too. We'll take your baby. And then, you know, we'll pay, we'll pay to have it. We'll do the whole thing. Right? There you go. That's the answer. That's the answer right there. The church needs to wake up and do it. Let's move on. Then we've got gay marriage. I was so sure when this thing passed and the White House was all lined up, lighted up with red, white, and blue colors, that the church would rise up and say, we're not doing this, we're not doing this. Nope, not a peep. It took a clerk in North Carolina to say she's not gonna, she's not gonna perform the marriage, and then everybody kind of rallied around her. This is how far down the rabbit hole we are. This is how far down, this is how late the hour is. Tell me where I'm going wrong. Tell me where I'm going wrong. Gay marriage 50 years ago? Are you out of your mind? And Obama, out of all the things that he could talk about, 92 million people out of the workforce, right? Another 50 million people on food stamps. 1% growth, GDP. 
You know, wars all over the place, infrastructure which is crumbling, racial divide. What subject, what topic is Obama pick? Transgender bathrooms. I'm not making it up. You think there's an agenda here? Hello. Then we've got this, Baphomet in Oklahoma City, just beyond the pale. 50 years ago, can you imagine these bozos trying to put a statue like this in Oklahoma? Maybe run out of town on a rail. No, you can't do that. LA is politically correct. Well, the Lord bless you, brother. Really? It's time to stand up peacefully and say, we're not doing this anymore. And then we've got the income tax thing. With 35% under Obama, plus another 10% in state, plus all the other stuff that we pay, we are now nothing more than indentured servants. We are modern day serfs. Modern day serfs. 50% of my income, almost, by the time I get done, goes to all these taxes and everything. What's left for me? What's left for me in my retirement? Social Security, 1,500 bucks a month? What am I supposed to do that? Open up a hot dog stand? The coming great deception, the rise of the supernatural. And I want to get a show of hands right now. You guys need to come up with the camera. So something is going on, and this is the dirty little secret in the church. And by the way, I will be, I'm working on a documentary film. It's called In Their Own Words. If you have a sighting and you want to come on camera, very pithy, short, concise, I don't need, well, I saw this thing 15 years, I just, I just need the story. And you want to come on camera, come over to my table, because I'll film you. And we'll, and, we'll, and we'll put, because what I'm doing is, everywhere I go, I know that people have experiences and they're afraid to talk about them. They're afraid to even tell their pastors, sometimes even their wives. But they'll come up and tell me, because I already have my tinfoil hat on. <laughs> and I wear it proudly. So something, guys, I need the camera up here if we're going to do this. Hello? Oh, here he is. Here he is. So, patience, L.A., patience. So something is going on on the planet. These are all UFOs. And I'm going to ask you right now, and I want a show of hands. This is going to be in the film. How many of you have had seen a UFO, sleep Hello, paralysis, or an encounter with a being? Just, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Keep them up. Hold them up. Look around. Look around. Not as many as we usually have. I would say we're about 10%. Usually it goes from about 5% up to 30% sometimes. So this is, this is the dirty little secret in the church. This is the dirty little secret in the church. People have had experiences and they can't talk about them. This is what Paul Hellyer has to say about uh, UFOs. He's, Paul Hellyer is the former, thank you for the, for the camera by the way, he disappeared again. <laughs> Paul Hellyer is the former Secretary of Defense uh, of, um, of the Canadian government and, and, and for the, Although I'm just going to skip to the chase here. But it, about 10 years Give ago volume, I started please. getting interested uh, due to a young man from Ottawa sending me material on the subject. I told him I was too busy to read it but he had confidence that someday I would. It took me a while to get around to reading it, but I took it uh, for my summer reading in 2005 and um, was really impressed with what was contained in it. And what I thought to myself is there are huge issues here, huge issues. And the American people and the people of the world have a right to know Hear that? what's going on because they're part of it. It's not just an isolated thing. I accept the invitation of Victor Vigiani, uh, who's over here somewhere, and his uh, cohort, uh, Mike Bird, to speak to a symposium at the University of Toronto. And uh, I said, UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead I'm at the University of Toronto. And uh, I said, UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. And uh, I said, UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. And uh, I said, UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. Watch this. This is from Kumbergaz in Turkey. 2007, 2008, 2009, a craft appeared over this lake. What you are seeing is a real craft. It's been vetted by the Turkish government. And those are real aliens in it. They're not aliens, by the way. They don't come from Zeta Reticuli. That's a three-hour conversation. 
But the UFO phenomenon is real, it's burgeoning, and not going away. And the church needs to understand that this could be the coming great deception. That's what I've labeled it. I called it that day almost, well, 1999, the first book in the Nephilim trilogy, Nephilim. That's, that's what I called it. This is the coming great deception. Think about it. I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but everything hinges on Darwinism. And Darwinism tells us that we were just an accident of evolution over billions of years. Well, the neo-Darwinists are looking at that going, eh, not so fast, pal. Darwin didn't know about the deoxyribonucleic double helix of life, the DNA molecular structure. Had he known about that, he would have gone, whoa, where did this come from? Well, Richard Dawkins, when Ben Stein in his movie Expelled sits down and says, where did life come from? He says, well, no one knows. Well, where do you think it came from? And all Dawkins can give us is panspermia. Well, maybe millions of years ago in a galaxy far, far away, we were invented here by some sort of a high civilization, gotten there by Darwinism. And it's like, that's, that's his paradigm. He's got nothing. He's got absolutely nothing. Zip, nada. He has no clue as how he got here. But we read in our scriptures that all things were created by him. All things were made by him. Without him, nothing that was made was made. Thank you. Who are you going to believe? Dawkins, who doesn't have a clue, or the Word of God? I'll take the Word of God because all through the Word of God there's a prophetic narrative, which is true. He's calling it out beforehand, a priori. Let's move on. This is really interesting. This guy's an ex-Raeli, and this is a cult. Notice the costume. And, and this guy writes, You may think that I give too much credibility to Rael's words, but what he says fits perfectly L.A.'s falling away scenario. Rael, who's got thousands of followers worldwide, he's an ex-racing -race, car driver, Claude Vorlerhorn. He changed his name, has a costume, run the nearest exit, right? When the Elohim, the aliens land, notice that. When the Elohim will land in Jerusalem, with Jesus, Moses, Muhammad coming out of a UFO. The majority will rally to the truth. Only a small number of fundamentalists will say that the Elohim are the devil or the Antichrist. So, guess what? Then we've got this, after disclosure. What if, the USA, what, if, what if UFO secrecy ended tomorrow? What happens when the powers that be finally admit that we are not alone and that the others we share the universe with are not light years away, some kind of cosmic pen pals chatting by radio telescope, but are here now? Are you aware that Mexico, Japan, Germany, France, Spain, England, Peru, all come on the record stating that the UFO phenomenon is real. The day that the U.S. releases it, that's the day it's over. Or if a mile wide craft appears. Or if a saucer just appears over New York City and just sits there. It's going to be an event. If a war happens in the Middle East, and this has been the scenario of the late David Flynn, which I talk to, and I, I, I agree with David, and I wrote about this, and I believe it's accurate. What's, what causes the greatest collective fear in all humanity? It's a, it's a detonation of a nuclear device. If something happens where we see a nu nuke detonated, it's all over, global, we're all connected, right? It creates the greatest climate of fear that mankind has ever known. That's when they show up, and they will say, we are your progenitors. We created all life on this planet. We genetically manipulated early man. Now at this critical juncture, oh, we started the world's religions. But now at this critical juncture, we're back to usher mankind into a time of peace, prosperity, and knowledge. Oh, and by the way, we've got this little implantable chip. You take it, you'll live 500 years disease-free. It's called a DNA upgrade, but I digress. I wish I could get into all this. About the time of the end, the body of men will be raised up and will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. Someone asked me, you know, all this just started, what, 30, 40 years ago in the Jesus Revolution with Chuck Smith way, way, way back at Calvary Chapel? Right? In, in, in the late 60s, early 70s, I mean, that's how far back it goes, right? And, all the, and Hal Lindsey's book, groundbreaking book, Late Great Planet Earth, and then all the Chuck stuff, and, all, and everybody's building. And now with the internet, you know, and now, now, the, now the new kids on the block, hello, that God's raised up. About the time of the end, the body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their little interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. You have no idea of the clamor and opposition that comes across our desk. But the Lord is faithful. He always gives us people that are just accolade after accolade after accolade. It's humbling. All glory to the king. Cast my crown. Sinner saved by grace. We are in the midst. And this is the good news. So I just outlined what Chuck would call, Dr. Chuck would call, the confidential briefing, right? that he tells his disciples, the confidential briefing. I outlined it, and it's up to you. All, I'm, all I am is the Domino pizza guy. Pizza! You gotta decide whether you're gonna eat it or not. I'm either crazy or everything I showed you is real, and I don't have time to get into more stuff to pile on the pizza. That was pepperoni and onions and mushrooms, lots of extra sauce. I'm getting hungry. You get what I mean? It's up to you to take all this information and say, well, maybe we are in that window of time where this is the birth pangs. Because that's what he calls them. 
We're in the birth pains. It ain't getting any better. It's not. It's one thing after another, after another, after another, and on and on it goes. So we are in the midst of a cosmic regime change. And I have trouble. I'm down to four minutes, 30 seconds. Yes! <sighs> I love when I finish on time. Notice how fast I have to talk to get all this in. <laughs> but I had, this, I had this, now I'll talk in my normal voice. Thank you. Thank you for being here, folks. No, seriously. About, I'm, I've been a Christian for 36 years. About 35, 36 years ago, a brand new Christian, never read the book of Revelation. In the body or out of the body, as Paul would say. I was taken up into a heavenly scene. I was there for basically three seconds. One, two, three, and then back. I had no idea what it was, but this is where I was. I was seated, oh, arm's length, LA, get back. I was seated on a white horse. No saddle, no mane, I mean, no bridle. No saddle, no bridle, holding onto the horse's mane. I don't like horses, for all you equestrians. I, I can't stay, they kick, they bite, they're nasty, right? So I don't like them. Every time I'm near a horse, I get, I get the bug eyes, like, oh, I'm walking away. Have a carrot, don't bite my hand. So I'm on this thing, and all around me are other riders on white horses. I can't remember what we were wearing. That's blocked out. It's really weird. Certain things are blocked out. The rider on the white horse, which I didn't know was Jesus at the time, is in the center. And I'm up here on the right flank, like way up here, about eight rows back from the front, but there's guys on top of me and guys below me. The armies of heaven are not spread out this way. The armies of heaven are in a horseshoe and then stacked up one upon another like this. Stacked up. Yeah, who can make this stuff up? I can't. Stacked up. And the rider on the white horse is there. And this is why I, if, when I read the scripture, I lose it because I was there for three seconds and I know what that felt like. And I know who the king is. And I know he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to nuke the fallen cherub. He's going to nuke the kingdom of Satan. And the white horse widers, which I've come to call the white horse police force, because this whole planet is absolute disarray. And he's going to rule in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And he descends on the Mount of Olives. Not Walla Walla, Michigan. He's coming back and it's got to be soon. And that baby's going to split in half when he comes. Let's listen. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his side, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's our king, and he's going to return. Glory to the king. Thank you, Father. So what do we do with all this information? The first thing is we need to get in the game. We need to repent of habitual sin. There's stuff in my life. There's stuff in your life. We keep falling down, but we get up. A righteous man gets up seven times, right? We keep getting up. And I've, the Lord showed me something, how, de how deceitful, how deceptive sin can be. You get that, just James talked to us, that little kernel, and we entertain it. We allow it to sit in there, and pretty soon... I just, I just, I just repent of something right here. My 94-year-old mother, who I've never had a relationship ever, ever, ever. I was rejected from the womb. That's a three-hour conversation. I've got one minute and ten seconds left. I'm not going to make it. Suffice it to say that she's living with us. Go figure that. And I've been disdainful towards her recently, and bitter towards her recently. And I was on my run, which is my prayer closet. And the Lord called me up and said, "You can't do this. You can't walk this way. You're an open door to the enemy." He's right. Repent, repent. I went back to my mom, kissed her on the forehead, and just said, I'm just sorry, mom. What for? Doesn't matter. Repent of habitual sin. So I confessed, confessed to one another. Put on the armor of God. When you, when you look at Ephesians 6, right? You look at Ephesians, what does it say? You put on the helmet of salvation. Who's your salvation? Jesus. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Who's our righteousness? Jesus. Put on the belt of truth. Who is the truth, the life, and the way? Jesus. The sandals of peace. Who is our shalom? Who is our peace? Jesus. The shield of faith. Who is the author and finisher of our faith? Jesus. Take the sword of the Spirit. Who is the word of God? I put on the armor of God. You've got to do it. You've got to do it sometimes two or three times a day because what it does is it centers us in him. It's all about him. It ain't about us. It's all about the king and the white horse police force. I can't wait for that. The horses fly. Hello. The horses fly. And you can't fall off no matter what you do. And I had to, I had to, I had the, the sensation that the horse 
and I could communicate. Oh, that's heresy, LA. That's impossible. Let's stone him in the parking lot. What do you say? Come on. But seriously, I had, I had this feeling that the horse, nothing happened. I was only there for three seconds. Come on. But I just had this feeling. Remember, no bridle, no saddle. I knew that there was no way the horse would ever let me fall off. And I just had this feeling that somehow we could communicate, but no communication. It wasn't Mr. Ed. Hello, Wilbur. <laughs> Destroy the works of the following one. You got a psychic in your neighborhood? Team up with a weak. And I know you got a psychic in the neighborhood. Oh, it's okay. They're harmless that way. Really? Really? Hook up with five or six people in your Bible study and commit to pray against that that psychic in your town, every, that's the, the Canaanite altars for crying out loud. Pray against it. Pray even that the person would come to a knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus or that the Lord would move them out. Period. Pray against it. Don't go petition with a sign down with the occult. Don't do that. Don't do that. But you can pray. You can get together and pray the psychic. They're everywhere. By the way, there's no such thing as Christian yoga. 17 seconds. The rider on the white horse is coming. I can't wait. Thank you for listening. You've been really great. God bless. <laughs> Glory to the king. Glory to the king.